Now, from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy, and welcome to Facing South Florida. In a few minutes, we'll have my interview with Howard Schultz, the former CEO of Starbucks, who is thinking of running for president as an independent. How much ego do you have to have to think you're the one that has the answer? <laughs> All right, we'll get the answer to that billionaire's question uh, in a few minutes. But first on the show, I want to turn to a dark and disturbing story as we've ever seen in South Florida. A serial sex offender, Jeffrey Epstein, the Palm Beach millionaire who preyed on teenage girls. You're screaming on the inside and you don't know how to let it come out. And you just become this numb figure who refuses to feel and refuses to speak and refuses, all you do is obey, that's it. And eventually it led to, well now we're gonna experiment and we're gonna try you with another guy and see how you go. So they sent me to an island with a professor and, and I basically had to do what I did for Jeffrey for him. So it's very private. It's the perfect world for a billionaire getting away with what he was doing. He could hold big parties there and, and have huge orgies there and nobody would have any idea what was going on. That was Virginia Roberts, one of Epstein's victims, speaking to the Miami Herald as part of their series, Perversion of Justice. The series also described how he paid teens to recruit other girls. By the time I was 16, I brought him up to 75 girls all the ages of you know 14, 15, 16, people going from 8th grade to ninth grade at just um, school parties is where I recruit him from. All Jeffrey cared about was go find me more girls. His appetite was insatiable. He, he couldn't stop. He wanted new, fresh, young faces every single day. In June 2008, Epstein cut a deal and pleaded guilty to two counts, including one for soliciting an underage prostitute and was sentenced to 18 months. But instead of being sent to a state prison like most sex offenders, his wealth and privilege allowed him to have his own private wing of the Palm Beach County Jail, his own security team, and he was allowed to essentially come and go from jail as he liked. But the biggest perversion of all was committed by the U.S. attorney at the time, Alex Acosta, who struck a secret deal with Epstein's high-powered lawyers to drop all federal investigations into his conduct. Even worse, the U.S. Attorney's Office lied to Epstein's victims, leading them to believe federal charges were coming when they knew they were letting Epstein off the hook. Now, 10 years later, thanks to the Miami Herald, that decision is facing new scrutiny. And Alex Acosta, who is currently Donald Trump's labor secretary, is under increasing pressure to resign. So where do things stand? Joining me this morning is Julie Brown of the Miami Herald, who along with Emily Michaud brought this case to light. Julie, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for having me. So, I guess what I, where I want to start is there was a ruling uh, within about a month or so ago from a federal judge that essentially said that Acosta and the U.S. Attorney's Office violated the law, specifically the law as it relates to notifying victims of crimes as to what was going on in the case. Talk to me a little bit about Judge Morrow's decision. Well, this was a case that was in the making for 10 years. These girls filed this uh, lawsuit against the uh, government right after they found out that something had happened in court. They didn't know what happened this in 2008. They just knew that all of a sudden the case was over, and they were stunned because they were never told what happened. They couldn't get a hold of the plea bargain. They couldn't get a hold of the paperwork that said exactly what happened. So they had to actually sue the government to just find out what he pled to. And it took them almost a year to actually get a copy of the agreement that said that he was pleading to lesser charges in state court. So they continued this lawsuit realizing that because they hadn't been informed about it, uh, that, that, that prosecutors had broken the Crime Victims' Rights Act. And it was, it, like I said, it took a whole decade, uh, and it, the judge just ruled finally last month that, it, in fact, the, the prosecutors, including Acosta, had broken this Crime Victims' Rights Act. The part of Mara's ruling was, and I'm reading now, when the government gives information to victims, it cannot be misleading. And that is essentially what the U.S. Attorney's Office, Alex Acosta and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Florida did. They misled these victims into believing their cases were still being investigated and that charges would be brought. 
Right. And, you know, even almost to the time that, that this all went down, uh, the FBI had a lot of evidence against Epstein. They were even finding out that he had been doing this in New York and in other places around the country. Uh, they had witnesses that said that he was recruiting girls from overseas. So they were, you know, they were building a case, but at the same time, the FBI was building a case. The, the prosecutors were really negotiating with uh, Epstein's lawyers. So let's take a step back for a second. Who is Jeffrey Epstein? How, how did this man be able to get such a sweet deal to be able to intimidate the U.S. Attorney's Office, to be able to come and go as he liked in the, in the state court system and out of the Palm Beach County Jail? Who is Jeffrey Epstein? He's a he's a actually a New York money manager. He worked for Bear Stearns early in his career, and he ended up um, getting to know a lot of very uh, wealthy people, and opened his own firm, to, uh, investment firm essentially, and he started representing only people who had a billion dollars or more. And as a result of his, him meeting all these very wealthy people, he also met people who were in, you know, President Clinton, um, President Trump, uh, you know, actors, actresses, uh, academics, um, royalty, royalty, Prince Andrew. So he, you know, he moved in that in those kinds of circles, and he had a lot of connections, and he spread. Quite frankly, he spent a lot of money around, spread it around to um, people who wanted it for their charities. For example, you know, Clinton had uh, the Clinton Foundation. So, you know, what he would do would he he donated a lot of money to a lot of charitable causes. His defense team at the time, go back ten years. Talk about who made up. Talk about dream teams of defense teams. Who was on his defense team? Well, it started with Alan Dershowitz because uh, Mr. Dershowitz was a friend of his who had stayed at his Palm Beach home with his family on vacation. Um, and it also included the uh, lawyer Roy Black. Um, and then when it became clear that he was in trouble, there was a criminal investigation into what he was doing, he, even though he w moved primarily in, in, in Democratic political circles. He shrewdly hired lawyers who were in Republican circles because uh, it was a Republican administration that was in power at the time that this case uh, was in front of the U.S. attorney. So he hired then Ken Starr, <clears throat> as we know, who was the Clinton Whitewater prosecutor, and he hired um, uh, um, Jay Lefkowitz, who was also a Republican, who they were all tied to the same law firm, and he and he also hired former members of this of the U.S. Attorney's Office in South Florida. Yeah. So he had people who knew connections into into way that had relationships. In fact, some of those people, one of those people, actually sat down with Alex Acosta when he was the U.S. Attorney here for a breakfast. Again, somewhat unusual to actually be able to have access to the U.S. Attorney's Office to be able to start cutting deals like this. Right. So, so we go to the situation where, now fast forward, Mara rules that this is a violation of the Crime Victims' Rights Act. But what comes as a result of that? Can, can, can Jeffrey Epstein face new rounds of charges? Well, this is all uncharted territory. This has never happened before. So I don't think anybody really knows what's going to happen. But, but I do know that the victims and their lawyers want this um, plea bargain, which was illegal. You know, that's essentially what the judge ruled, that the plea bargain is legal. They want it thrown out. They want him to go to prison. How they can do that, um, I think, uh, is going to be the question. I, I know that her lawyers have prepared a whole legal strategy, argument, citing case laws on how they can go about this. But of course, the government is probably going to uh, present this a similar strategy. This is why you can't overturn it. So it'll end up in Mara's hands again to really decide what to do. Cynic at home is going to sit here and say, you know what, these women, they just want money. They, they, they're just they're doing this because they want to get paid at the end of the day. You, you, deal with the, you deal with a lot of these victims. Talk to me about that. Well, this crime victims' rights case is 
has nothing to do with money. They're, they've never sought any money. This is a case that, that just said they violated the law. So they're not, they've never sought money in this particular case. Um, and to be honest with you, they've never, they've always felt like they were mistreated by the criminal justice system. That's why I did this story. So what do they want? What do the victims want in this case? They want him to go to prison. They want him to be held accountable just like any other person uh, who, who ha committed a crime like this. So one of the questions that I have is, you know, the what is Jeffrey Epstein doing these days? Does he still manage famous people and rich people's money? Is he what is he doing now? Is he not become a pariah? No, not really. Uh, I don't think he he moves. You know, he's pretty much under the radar right now. I don't think he moves in in very social a lot of social circles right now. But after his release from prison, he certainly returned to his jet setting life, and he certainly held a couple parties. In fact, one for Prince Andrew that a lot of celebrities and even uh, some journalists attended. Uh, and you know, he, he continued to donate, spread a lot of money around, which ingratiated him to a lot of people, arts organizations, universities, scientific organizations. Let me play devil's advocate for a second, because those who support Alex Acosta, the U.S. attorney who's now the former U.S. attorney who's now the labor secretary, say that essentially the U.S. attorney's office did the best they could. These cases are very difficult to make. The, the victims in these cases, you know, have difficult backgrounds. Some have drug histories. You have a situation where they may not, not might make the best witnesses. And so by getting a conviction, by getting them registered as a sex offender, and also getting some compensation for these victims in civil court processes, that at the end of the day, that's the best justice they could hope for. Well, I, it wasn't the best justice that the, that the women hoped for. They felt that it wasn't justice at all. And by pleading to a charge of prostitution, it sens essentially uh, categorized these girls, by the way, they were, you know, 13, 14, 15 year olds, as prostitutes. And really, there is no such thing as a child prostitute. That's, it's, it's not. It's a rape victim. Right? Yeah. I mean, they were taken advantage of. These were vulnerable girls, number one. And number two, I mean, let's face it, there's a good chance he could be out there doing this right now I mean we don't know but he is still flying around and he he I don't find any evidence that anyone is really monitoring him so one of the issues is that uh, you've been fighting in and the Miami Herald has been fighting in federal court in New York to, uh, to unseal more records in this case right talk to me a little bit about that and what are you hoping to find in these records well, this was a, a defamation suit that was brought by Virginia Roberts against... The woman we saw at the very beginning. That's right. Um, she was recruited by a woman by the name of Yelan Maxwell, who was a partner of, of Epstein's. And essentially what she, she alleges is that Yelan helped recruit these girls for him. She was sort of the madame of his operation, so to speak. And when she went public accusing her of that, uh, Geelin called her a liar. So essentially they ended up in court in a defamation suit. But they really were trying to use that lawsuit as a vehicle to expose their sex trafficking operation. Um, the lawsuit was settled. Um, and but most of it was sealed. Um, the judge in the case, so many of it did involve some sensitive information that the judge essentially just issued a blanket sealing order. So a lot of the information has never been made public. Harold went to court to argue that some of this information should be made public because it's evidence of a crime and could also show evidence of how the criminal case against him might have been tainted. All right, I want to turn to Alex Acosta in our remaining moments. He's currently the U.S. Labor Secretary. He, he, you've tried on many occasions to try to speak to him. I know other reporters have. He does not, will not talk about this. Um, it seems as if the White House isn't really embracing him very well. We're taping this Friday morning. It would not shock me if he suddenly resigns as early as this afternoon. Friday afternoons are usually a good time to take out the trash on news stories. <laughs> and, you know, but I'm amazed that he's lasted this long. Are you, are you surprised that Alex Acosta is still the U.S. Labor Secretary? I don't know. I mean, you know, the president keeps a lot of people, uh, you know, under his umbrella who have uh, problematic past so I don't I wouldn't say that I'm surprised but there is a lot of pressure because this is not really I always tell people this isn't really a Republican or a Democrat issue um, sexual assault uh, doesn't you know discriminate based on political party and there are a lot of Republicans that, that feel that that 
he should resign. A lot of Democrats as well, and we'll see if more Republicans step forward. Julie Brown, thank you very much thank for you. your amazing reporter. You, along with Emily Michaud, who, who shot this wonderfully as well. Thank you again for your time. All right, up next, my interview with Howard Schultz, the former CEO of Starbucks, who is considering a run for president as an independent. That's when we come back.